Welcome to the show, Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have a very special guest. I'm going to have you introduce yourself. My name is Bradley Jahan Brugerdi. I'm assistant professor of history at Tarrant County College. My uh, manuscript, the title of my manuscript is From Court of Empire to Band Intoxicant, A Cultural History of Hemp in an Atlantic World from 1600 to 1900. Uh, I'm working with Oxford University Press at the moment. Uh, the manuscript is with them. Uh, and in terms of courses that I teach in the history department or the, the global studies department technically, but I am a, his, a cultural historian, I teach uh, uh, world history courses from a commodity perspective, uh, commodities perspective. I teach African American history and I teach the U.S. history survey courses. And occasionally I will teach a course, uh, an upper level course at the University of Texas at Arlington as an adjunct uh, on the hemp plant uh, and hemp and culture. Excellent. And I came across your work as I was preparing for my course at CU Denver called Cannabis Cultures. So you have been studying hemp for quite a bit and you did a a dissertation on it. So tell us about the the study that you did and um, one or two of the most compelling findings uh, in your work. Yeah, so um, one of the things about this dissertation, uh, which is now a book manuscript, um, is that it's a little bit controversial because people ask me, well, 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 what is hemp? And they assume hemp is always associated with fiber. And one of the things I found, uh, the most, I think, important thing of, of this book is that uh, there is this sort of intertwined history between the three main uses of the hemp plant, right? And I think uh, that when you begin to do research and look into uh, the, the sources, you find that the, the phrase hemp has been qualified uh, and used uh, to describe the medicinal uses, the intoxicating uses, as well as the industrial uses. And although even today the industrial uses are the main associations with the word hemp, we still see these lingering kind of historical realities that still associate the word hemp with various other uses. And so one of the things that my uh, work does is try to kind of look at the plant holistically, look at it and look at how these different meanings uh, of this word have helped uh, Anglo-Americans uh, as well as uh, um, Anglos in the UK to f- fashion a meaning for the plant that dramatically transformed then from what they used to see this plant as, right? In, in the Anglo-Atlantic uh, culture is what I call it, this kind of transatlantic dialogue between uh, uh, the British uh, subjects of, of, the, of, the, of the colonial British Empire and as well uh, after the American Revolution, this kind of dialogue between what is this plant? Is it valuable? Is it not? And it kind of was perceived to be an extremely valuable plant and then dramatically transformed, obviously, uh, as you know, to this banned intoxicant that we're still dealing with. And so my, my, my book tries to trace that cultural transformation that this plant endured. In the publication that you, you have, it's um, filled with some images. So do you want to tell us about one or more of those images and what they mean to you? Sure, yeah. So there were a number of different images from a vast array of different sources that were really perfect for this for this topic because they all bind the meaning of hemp together in different ways, right? And so I have some of them say, for example, uh, William Bailey. He has multiple d- of different sources from the 18th century, the mid-18th century. And this guy was simply just a member of the Royal Society uh, promoting the arts of manufacturing. He was... He was uh, Uh, writing treatises that were designed to try to influence people in the British Empire to try to grow hemp. Because despite what many people think today, particularly hemp activists, um, hemp was a very difficult plant to to grow and to produce and to ensure that it was high enough quality to be successful. That's why they had to rely so heavily on Russia for most of their uh, hemp production. And so there were a number of these different treatises that were that, that had very specific details about how to grow the plant, the best way to do it, tried to promote a lot of people to do so. And if you look at William Bailey's uh, sources, you see these very kind of enlightenment images that are uh, trying to, to, to describe... Um, how, you know the best ways to grow uh, to, to grow it and manufacture it, right? And so you see these very elaborate, intricate details uh, of these lithographs that were published, which were you know rather expensive at the time to get to get published uh, and and put in these books that are trying to kind of show people how to do this. And if you look at these images, they 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 hold this kind of connotation of enlightenment 
you know, the, the Europeans are sort of on the march. They're trying to figure out the world. They're trying to understand the world. And these images in, in his treatise really kind of indicate that hemp was a part of this new modernizing world, this attempt to kind of um, take commodities, uh, manipulate them into the way we need them used. And uh, these images, I think, really kind of capture this, this industrial nature of hemp's production. And you still kind of see that, that today. Uh, for example, uh, you know, many people use this popular mechanics article, 1938 article that says, uh, you know, hemp was destined to be the next billion dollar crop before the conspiracy theories destroyed it. And I think looking at William Bailey's images, along with a number of others that continued throughout uh, the 18th and 19th century, uh, looking at those help us understand that this popular mechanics article was just one in a series of of articles that came out regularly where people were really trying to promote this idea that hemp um, uh, needs to be uh, used a little bit differently, needs to be manipulated differently, and we got to really sh sh promote this idea if we're going to be successful in trying to get people to, uh, to, to, to produce it. Is there one or two images that are more contemporary that you just want to share with us um, from your manuscript? Sure. Yeah, there's a uh, there's an image there uh, that I found at the uh, Houghton Library at Harvard University. There's this collection there uh, that was given. It's called the Santo, Dom the Santo Domingo uh, Fitzhugh Ludlow Santo Domingo uh, Library uh, kind of collection that has all kinds of stuff connected to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and one of the images that I found there with that has that doesn't have an author listed. It's called "Free the Weed," uh, and it has this 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 uh, cannabis leaf with glass on it that's being chained up. And I I just love that image because number one, it, it, it's the very kind of iconic uh, cannabis leaf, which many people call the marijuana leaf. Uh, again, uh, erroneously, but the cannabis leaf, which evokes so much meaning for so many people. This is the leaf that, as you saw in one of my other images, uh, shows a boy, uh, Joe's story, looking at it in a very kind of menacing way. And that, that, that image shows this kind of negativity. Contrast that with this new image here, which is a more contemporary uh, image, a modern image, and you see uh, a much different uh, meaning, a meaning to sort of rally up, to try to demonstrate this, this oppression that is connected to um, sabotaging people's lives because of this, this plant. And another image there that I found off a blog uh, is, a, is a fascinating image as well of Thomas Jefferson with somebody kind of putting a little joint in his mouth like he's, like he's smoking it, which kind of obviously uh, plays on these ideas that have been around for a while that uh, George Washington... Uh, and Thomas Jefferson smoked marijuana, which, of course, we have no evidence to suggest that was the case. And in fact, when they write in there, uh, or it's particularly George Washington, when he writes about separating the female and the male plants, many people said, that's code. He was, he was growing sense of media. Uh, no, you had to separate that as well if you were growing hemp industrially for seeds versus growing hemp industrially for fiber. Uh, and, but I love these images because they just show how far the transformations in perspective has come, uh, and the same plant, dramatically different interpretations of it, depending on who's interpreting it. So um, circling back a bit, um, you know, you, you talked about the different words, you know, cannabis, hemp, um, marijuana. So for clarity, you know, what do they refer to and what misuses of these terms have you seen throughout the years? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the misuses are just so pervasive. You know, many people oftentimes say that uh, marijuana is uh, the cousin of hemp, for example, right? Uh, or hemp is a uh, type of marijuana that doesn't get you high. And, you know, it, it's rather surprising just how, you know, misused the word marijuana is, even in books that I love tremendously, like, uh, you know, uh, this, 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 this new recent one that came out by uh, Chris Duvall called Cannabis, um, in certain areas he refers to the term synonymously as well, uh, and multiple sources do this. But I think, you know, since words are so important to uh, my analysis, 
Uh, it, it, it's important for us to understand that we need to be able to separate these words because words mean something. Words carry very significant meaning. And if we're not using them precise, uh, then we, we can evoke meaning at times that we're not trying to evoke certain meanings, right? And so to be clear, marijuana is a flower that grows on a genetic, a, a specific genetic variety of the hemp plant. The hemp plant, the word hemp can and should be used synonymously with cannabis. Those two are the same uh, and mean the same. They, they hold different connotations though, right? I mean, when you think of cannabis, oftentimes when people are writing about it, they're writing about medicine or they might think of, you know, I mean, we, we have had this word medical marijuana come uh, more, more frequently uh, of, as of late, but still cannabis tends to hold a medical marijuana connotation more. Uh, marijuana itself tends to hold a little bit more of a recreational connotation, and hemp tends to hold a little more industrial uh, connotation, but it's important, I think, for my study and for people to understand uh, who are interested in my study is that uh, in terms of, for, for history, for, for historical purposes, the term hemp and the term cannabis are in fact synonymous, and the word hemp has been used and manipulated so many times throughout history. Um, you know, if it's oftentimes when, when, when Anglos would be referring to the intoxicating version, they would call it Indian hemp because they associated uh, Asia with this kind of Orientalist fa uh, perception of these lazy kind of uh, degenerates who take good productive commodities from the West and contaminate them uh, by turning them into drugs. And many people thought that uh, the intoxication of hemp uh, was something that the environment in the East did to this plant. Uh, of course, they didn't really have much understanding of THC or the chemical properties of the plant while they were while they were making these uh, these assumptions. But um, I think that's important to understand. But also, uh, and we see this quite uh, significantly in in the Americas as well. Um, people started to use the word hemp also to simply. Uh, identify any plant that was used for fiber. Plants that, 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 were, that had no botanical relationship to hemp at all. Uh, if Americans saw that, saw that plant used as uh, a fiber, then they would refer to it as hemp. And this kind of creates some uh, deep con confusion in the sources because when Americans say Indian hemp, oftentimes they're referring to Native Americans using various different plants for fiber that have no relationship with hemp at all. But when uh, the British use the word Indian hemp, they're referring to um, Indians in the subcontinent using the, the, uh, the cannabis plant that they associated so much with fiber for improper uses. And so all of this stuff, I think, demonstrates that there is this this whole topic is rift with confusion uh, and misinformation uh, and has and carries so much baggage with it that needs to be broken down before we can actually have a conversation if we really want to understand why this plant transformed the way it did. So so to summarize, what's the terms that you think are, are useful and, and why? So like in one or two sentences, uh, you know, just to pull together that um, great response you just shared with us. Sure. Uh, so I would say that uh, hemp is the best word. Hemp is the word I use. Hemp is the word that I use in the title. And the reason I do that is because hemp is the only one out of all of these words that we know today to describe this plant. Hemp is the only one that has historically been used by different people in different Anglo societies to refer to all three of the main uses of the plant. And I think that is the most important point, because if we want to understand why this plant transformed the way it did, then we need to understand uh, this very important fact, because people were confused about hemp. They were deeply confused about hemp, still are, uh, but they, they, were, they were deeply confused about hemp. And that confusion uh, and their use of that word uh, is what I think contributed significantly to this transformation to a and intoxicant that we have today. So you maintain this idea of no value claims. So why is it important for you to remain neutral or to avoid bias in your hemp studies? Well, that, that's, that's another great question. Um, and, you know, well, first off, as a historian, uh, you should always try this, no matter what your topic is. Uh, of course, as a cultural historian, I admit 
uh, that it's impossible to mitigate your biases, right? Uh, we all have biases. Uh, you cannot escape them. All you can do is try to minimize the influence of your bias as much as possible in order to demonstrate more objective value of your work. Uh, but I felt compelled to say that at the beginning of my, uh, of my manuscript because particularly with this topic, um, hemp is so, has so much baggage on both sides. Um, people who write about this plant either hate it so badly and want everyone to see how horrible it is, or they love it so much and they think it's the greatest thing on the planet and they want everybody to see how wonderful they are. And both sides tend to make sweeping generalizations that do not reflect reality. And obviously, if you're a hip activist, you have it has almost become kind of like a rite of passage to describe the ridiculous nature of reefer madness and the, the notion that you go murder people when you get high on marijuana and things like this. Um, and everybody sort of comically looked at these things and talked about how ridiculous uh, all of this stuff is. And then, therefore, it has led them to believe that everything that comes from that period is worthless uh, and it's all wrong. And then they start kind of propping up all of these other myths. Like one of the things you hear people say, which I was at a cannabis conference uh, a couple of weeks ago here in Fort Worth, uh, and one of the speakers got up and said, you all need to read Jack Herrer. He's a god. He's His book, Emperor Wears No Clothes, it's full of truth. It's the greatest thing. And it, it debunks all these conspiracies. But, you know, that's not a very good uh, scholarly book. I love Jack Herrer's uh, activism, and I love what he stands for. But there are so many sweeping generalizations in that book that they do not reflect reality. And that's not the only one. I'm not going to pick on Jack Herrer. Uh, almost every book uh, that I have read is full of either some sort of misinformation or uh, exaggeration in order to get somebody's agenda done. And as a, as a cultural historian, uh, as I said, you, you can't end your biases, but as a historian in general, you want to kind of step back from that stuff uh, and provide as much sources to the historical community to demonstrate to them that, look, um, I'm not taking sides here to try to pick something and promote an agenda at the expense of scholarly research. Scholarly research is important. And I make the argument uh, throughout my book that I don't need to have an agenda because I think the sources speak for themselves. It's quite clear uh, that if you don't manipulate sources, you don't try to pontificate on whether or not George Washington smoked marijuana uh, or Jefferson smoked marijuana, which there's no evidence for, and you actually just stick to the sources, you can still accurately determine the activist uh, conclusion, I believe, which is that it is rather nonsensical that this, that this plant is illegal today. One concern that researchers have as they go into this topic is the issue of being stigmatized. So, so as you did this work and in your current um, work in, in hemp studies, um, have you been stigmatized or what suggestions would you have for young scholars who are considering but maybe waffling because they don't want to be associated with this, uh, this uh, toxic topic? My first response would be, yes, it is there. It is going to be there and you're just going to have to deal with it. Uh, you have to love uh, your topic uh, more than you fear uh, stigmatization, I think, uh, because it's going to be there. Um, every single time I have presented on this topic, every time I have introduced myself almost uh, to some people, whether or not they're uh, academics or uh, in, in, the, in the private sector or what, it doesn't matter. They cannot go five minutes without cracking a joke. Uh, the first time, uh, you know, or uh, you got great research opportunities or, you know, they'll say some kind of thing that hints at the uh, intoxicating nature of it, right? And this is something you're going to have to deal with. Uh, people snickering uh, because there's just so much uh, misunderstanding and, and so much cultural meaning, thick description, or, or I should say really thick meaning uh, invested in this plant that evokes so much meaning in people's mind. And so I, I've dealt with it forever. And in a way, in terms of my personality, I just sort of embrace it. And I'm just like, fine, whatever. I, I don't have an issue with it. Um, but, you know, I, I, can, I, I, can, I can see how serious uh, and problematic it can be, particularly for, for people who have an image that they want to portray to society. Uh, I can tell you, 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 you'll have to deal with that. And uh, it's there. It's very real. Um, all I can say is that I hope it, 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 it starts to go away. Uh, the more people become 
uh, desensitized, I, I should say, maybe uh, towards uh, hemp uh, and marijuana and, and all of its uses. Um, so it's there. You know, any last closing remarks, something we didn't cover or anything you just want to provide um, as we wind up the interview? And one of the images that I have by William Hogarth uh, that talk, that shows the harlot beating hemp, I, this is something I really would like to point out because there are so many different, back to these misperceptions and things like that, uh, uh, there are so many different reasons why hemp becomes so uh, demonized. And one of the reasons that we don't tend to see oftentimes in the sources is the labor realities of hemp and the individuals who were involved in producing this hemp. In that image, you see these harlots, women who've been arrested, uh, who are in trouble, uh, and they are, being met, they are being forced to beat hemp uh, as a way to kind of, you know, meet out their punishment. And in the United States, we oftentimes forget that uh, slave labor was the primary engine behind, um, behind uh, uh, hemp uh, labor as well. And both of these forms of labor, slave labor, um, uh, convict labor, these aren't labor, uh, these aren't people who have very much motivation to be very well. They're not being compensated for their labor, obviously. And it was very difficult to get people who weren't forced uh, to actually uh, use their labor on this plant because it is a very labor intensive plant. And this, this labor reality of this plant is one of the main reasons why it never succeeded. One of the things I would really like for people to understand is that if you look at the resource, you don't need to convert to the, or conform to uh, or endorse these sort of conspiracy theories, to use a lack of better words, I guess, or a better phrase. Uh, to come up with why it is that hemp did not succeed. It's very simple. The, the, the plant was very difficult to produce. It was hard. They didn't have the machinery, despite trying on multiple occasions to create new technology to help it. It didn't work. And they weren't processing it properly. They were using something that, that, that they called dew rotting as opposed to water redding, which is what the Russians used. Uh, and all of these things here are very important to understanding the story for why hemp became a problem. And rather than try to say it was the greatest plant on earth and these, this, this huge wave of people came in to try to demonize it to, to you know, uh, William Randolph Hearst and all these things. If you look at the actual sources, these people actually thought that this plant was, was bad because uh, the history around it suggested so. Uh, people who were perceived as criminal, people who were perceived in negative ways were the ones who were associated with this plant from a very long time. And those who tried to use it for productive purposes oftentimes uh, were unable to do so. The tinctures that people started to make, once, once the Americans started to realize that this could be something that's used for medicine, the way they were making the tinctures did not work. The type of things that they were using did not work. So all of these things kind of combined to say, well, look, there's all of these things that we have that, we, that, that we're trying with this hemp plant. It's not working. And we hear all these strange stories about these people from the Orient who are using it and doing strange things and going crazy. And all of this stuff kind of led to the knowledge culture that was created that helped people jump to the conclusion that hemp is bad, that we don't need it. And now that we have more research to know that most of all of those uh, perceptions about the plant uh, were culturally constructed, then we can now start using what we know to back off if we can uh, mitigate our biases and our perspective, which obviously is being a really difficult thing to get people to realize in many areas of, of the United States. So Bradley, thank you again. And I really appreciate talking to you. And I know my viewers are going to um, uh, really enjoy hearing uh, a lot of your responses. So you have a great day. You too. Thank you, Marty. Take care.